Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the worthy one, the holy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So I hope. I hope everybody is having a good smiling weekend that this week, and I hope you had a good holiday if you're celebrating Christmas. And Christmas, you know, is a pretty good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. And, um, and uh, a lot of the things in uh, Buddhism match up with the Christian concepts about a lot of things. And one of the things I had an opportunity to do not long ago, I may have mentioned to you all also, was that I did a retreat with 16 Catholic nuns. I was invited to do this. They were novice nuns that will be taking higher ordination in, in, uh, in Rome at the Vatican next year, 2022, I think at the end of the year is when they finally do this after six or seven years together as a group from 16 different areas in, in India. And this is a, a real special time. So I had I said yes to doing this retreat for them uh, because I wanted the opportunity to actually have uh, a set of people like that in one spot to see how uh, aligned this teaching was with this group. And the reason I said yes to them mm, was because they were uh, coming, their, their tradition comes from St. Francis of Assisi. And if you don't know about St. Francis of Assisi, I'll clue you tell in the, the Catholics are very, the saints are very important to them. And this particular monk became a saint because he could sit in meditation very quietly and sit in a field or on a heap of straw. Remember that line, okay? And he could sit there and then all the animals would come and land on him or sit around him. And the question I uh, said, people would say, well, that's not possible. Well, that is possible, it is possible. And I know it happened to me. I did it once when I was on a mountain uh, at the center. I went up and I had some brown robes and covered myself with brown robes. And then, of course, at that time, I have to tell you what happened, because after two hours of sitting, I opened my eyes and there were birds sitting around me and on me and little little uh, chipmunks, small squirrels coming up to me and everything. And um I was surprised, but I didn't move. I didn't move a muscle. And then when I was walking down the mountain to tell Bonte what happened, I got this picture in my mind examining what was in that area by this big rock that I had been sitting on and this big tree in front of me and then some other large trees around me. And I got this in my mind, what really happened? Because we're supposed to look at what essentially is happening, not what is unessentially happening. And so I'm watching what exactly happened here and what was going on. I, I summarized it and said, well, uh, I, the tree is brown. I'm brown, the, wrapped up in these robes, just covering me completely so no bugs would bite me. And uh, I didn't move and the tree didn't move. <laughs> and I'm thinking that's the only reason, but the reason was because I since then really understand this and can show someone how to do this. If you let go of any fear or anything at all and you're just sending loving kindness out, then what's happening is you're producing a frequency. And the frequency you are producing is a very calm, quiet, and safe frequency. So they don't have any concern. Snakes come, they just go over your feet. You know, birds come, they land in your lap, you know, and anything small crawls around you but doesn't bite you. You know, it's very strange. And this is all happening because uh, this meta is giving this type of a frequency and and it's coming out from you. So today I want to talk to you uh, about the, the way that this is changing people and and I want to talk to you a little bit about Satipatthana Sutta because 
Satipatthana is an interesting thing. It, it has caused in, in the writings of people uh, take, well, I don't think they really mean it. Sometimes the authors don't mean it to go this far with people in their mind, but they would say Satipatthana Sutta. Then they would say Satipatthana Sutta, the way to waking up or something. And then they would say the only way. And then they would say the ultimate way. And over the years, it gets more and more serious about Satipatthana Sutta. So one time a monk came up to me after I did uh, a class. It was a project for two or three hours with a whole room full of monastics, teaching them about the middle view of dependent origination. And we, we really like to teach this to you, and we like you to understand that the, the middle view means that uh, from anything that's happening in your life, you can learn to take seven of the links in dependent origination and look at what's happening and know exactly what is happening, understand it. So we're teaching that to them, and it was a great class. It was really fun. Everybody got involved. There was about I think it's about 25 people in that class, but there were some uh, taros, you know, the monks with at least 10 years that were there in the class. And one walked up to me and he said, write to me, you know, this is all very nice about dependent origination, but sister, all we really need is the Satipatthana Sutta and that's all. And then he, before I could even think it through or <laughs> respond, he turns around and he just walks away. Like that's the statement, that's the fact, you really only need to do that. Satipatthana has become sort of overly important. It is important. And I want you to understand that what happens to us uh, when we are um, practicing TWIM, sometimes in our, uh, our retreats that are 10 days long, you don't hear very much about Satipatthana, you see? So uh, you, can, you can write this down if you want the, um, basically, uh, what is that thing? Maybe not yet. I can't write anything for you right now. It's a marvelous thing. This, this pen was a lot of fun and I used it for a long time. And then I wanted to understand why it wasn't writing. Now this is, you have a, a taste of my adventure with digital, the digital world. So here is the pen and it's out of, something so i'm thinking there must be a, a a uh there must be a battery in this pen by the shape of it you can see you know it's it makes sense but it's awfully small and i'm not sure you know and so finally after about a week and a half accidentally i bumped the top and pulled at the same time and there it is it's inside but then what's inside i gave it to somebody i can't show it to you but what's inside is a 4a battery Oh my gosh, a 4A battery. I used to have trouble getting a 3A battery for the control for the TV or something for the kids. Now there's a 4A battery. No one knows where to go get one. So I have someone now who's probably going to go to Amazon to find one. And so, and they'll send it to me. And, um, but of all the places, this is the on off switch but I couldn't make it do anything until I pressed it and pulled it at the same time. And there it was. So anyway, I can't write, I can't draw pictures for you or anything right now, but this little book is interesting for a particular reason. It's called Awakening with Meta. And it was put together uh, for the well-being and the happiness of all. It says on the front cover and it was Venerable Mahinda who did this. Now, I'm not sure if he's still alive or not. He's the same age as me. I hope so. <laughs> he was born in 1949 too. Okay. And the connection is that uh, he was uh, with K. Sri Dhammananda for a long time. So my teacher knew him and, um, and someone sent this book to me and I'm there. Wow. You know, I know who this was. I, I looked at the picture and I I don't know if he's still there at uh, the Maha Buddhist Vihara, uh, but he would be um, close to 72, just like me, okay? And um, and he wrote this in a, in a good way, a really nice way. So the section on Satipatthana is important because I need everybody in the world to know that when we practice twim, we do not skip what you're supposed to learn in Satipatthana. 
This is what I really want people to understand. We don't spend a lot of time uh, with it in our retreats. Sometimes uh, with advanced meditators, we will give a whole talk on Satipatthana. You can find them in the index. Uh, for the talks at Damasuka, you can go there and look in the library and find Satipatthana talks. If you wanted to study to see what Bhante Vimala Ramsey actually says about Satipatthana, you could actually, or what Satipatthana was all about in depth, you could actually listen to him give that talk about 10 times. I think it's, it's the, recorded in the uh, library. A lot of times he'll only do one day with it. Many times, though, in the past, uh, meaning 10, 12 years back, he was giving like two days to it. But now we realize something. We realize that what you're supposed to be learning in Satipatthana is learned really completely and very deeply and clearly when you're practicing TWIM and you're practicing with the, uh, the right effort the way that we're showing you. So... He's talking about this and saying, you know, when we develop a practice of metta, we should start to become uh, more sensitive about how our thoughts, uh, our thoughts and speech and our body actions are working and, um, and how they actually cause the suffering to both ourselves and to others. And that's what we're trying to learn about when we're practicing in Buddhism, when we are practicing the Buddha Dhamma, what Gautama Buddha actually taught, he was teaching you a couple special things I want you to remember. First of all, he was teaching you how to connect a communication system inside of you. Uh, how to connect it so it's all operating correctly. And he found out that people have this connection, this, this system of communication, but it's not developed. So let's stop for a second and think about how uh, does uh, craving and clinging, how does that actually start? And where do we learn that when we're growing up? So if we go back into childhood development for human being, we're going to find they children are reflecting whatever is around them. So they're learning how to behave precisely from what they're seeing and hearing and experiencing. And then they're copying it. They're repeating, repeating, repeating. So they come to us with an empty, uh, pure, empty mind, you know, an empty mind that is not or empty headed children. There you go. <laughs> No, but an empty, an empty child is a baby that comes and is born and can't even speak. And then it learns by mimicking you how to speak. And it learns to investigate things when it gets to start walking and crawling. It's investigating everything. And, and then it learns, touch this, it's an ouch. Don't touch it again. And it goes from there to more and more complex things. Well, it it, it learns your behavior, also patterns. And I'm going to tell you something, too, about this talk. I had two cups of coffee this morning, and somebody's making it too strong. So when you listen to this talk, this is your week to turn to the YouTube and go in and find the speed. <laughs> okay. And go up in the left corner, touch the three buttons. And when it goes to normal speed, put it at point. Seven five, and I will try to slow it down for you. But we've had crazy things happening this morning with lights going out, waters overflowing, dogs peeing inside, things falling down on top of me, and and we're in a retreat and we're crowded in a little place. We're actually having fun. There's only four people here doing this. They've all gone into the, uh, you know, this is the best part. They've all gone through the whole path and are down in nothingness and neither perception or non-perception. And it's four days, four days since they've done this. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, I think I'm beginning to refine this the way Bhante has this put together uh, in a way where everything we are teaching you in our retreats is compounding. You see, it's uh, what do you say? Causally related, May. You know what I mean? Yeah, causally related. And this year, 
my thing this quarter of the year, whatever you want to say, the last quarter of the year has been going back and looking at groups of things that you learn in Buddhism. And if there's a group, are they causally related? Are they conjoined or disjoined? Or how does it work to learn this part? And what effect does it have on that part if there are four or five pieces in the group? You got it? So this is what we, we've been looking at. I've been spending time looking at this because it is very interesting. So what he's saying here, he's saying when we develop a deep sense of concern and compassion for ourselves and others to have an ultimate well-being, that means to eventually be free from all suffering. We're working together to support each other like we're trying to do now with groups of people doing TWIM. We will be motivated naturally to proceed to the next stage of our practice after we first start with the first stage. Now, the first stage of your practice was to take a look at generosity. <laughs> That's where we go back to the beginning. Take a look at generosity. And when you're being generous with your thoughts, your words, and your actions, that comes out to other people. But something's happening for you. You are giving that, but something's happening to you with your heart. Your heart is softening and opening and trusting you to go in the direction further that is a wholesome direction. So this, this dana was a really important step to understand. No, it doesn't just mean when you grow up, take food to the monks at the temple. It meant that was a good thing for merit and one of the highest merits that you can gain when you are working with the temple and the monks and nuns. That's a very important thing to please help us be able to survive so we can keep doing this for you. But, but the real effect was it was opening your heart and softening it so that it's ready to then look at the Sheila. And we learned this Donna and Sheila at the same time. The Sheila, the Sheila, uh, what that is, is your five precepts. Now your five precepts that you learn are like an umbrella Okay, there the precepts are the actual umbrella. And these five precepts, if as long as you keep those five precepts as a layperson, then the hindrances do not attack you like acid rain coming down on you. Okay. The umbrella is protecting you from the lust and greed, too much lust and attachment. It's protecting you from uh, too much uh, uh, anger and aversion. It is protecting you uh, from sloth and torpor, feeling guilty afterwards when you break uh, one of those precepts. It is, um, you know, uh, it is protecting you from this, this result of sloth, I'm too tired to work and you're drooping at work. Okay, or school. And then the next one is restlessness, guilt, and remorse because you broke one of those precepts. This, this is the problem. So you have that as a result, and you can't work and you can't work around people, and it makes life difficult. So to protect yourself from the problem when you break these precepts, uh, you know, to I'm so protect yourself from the hindrances. We keep the precepts in place, not just at a retreat. If you, you know, there was a saying, I learned it, but I'm not very good at it. I'll never be a, a, an expert at it. Someone would say that to you. They say, because whenever I tried to learn what you're talking about, I had two steps forward. And, you know, piano students do this, May. You know, they come to you and they learn how to do something with their fingers and they learn perfectly in front of you. But next week when they come back, they're doing it wrong again. You know what I mean? Because I used to help my kids on piano. 
And then, and then what happens what, what was they went two steps forward and one step back. They didn't practice enough doing it the right way forward, uh, two steps forward and keep practicing whatever they learned so that it got in here. So the next week, they can't remember exactly how to do it smoothly. And she thinks they're learning it, but actually it's going to take repetition, 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 repetition to get to the point where you understand the usefulness of that fingering when you're doing piano so that you can play smoothly. Well, in, in meditation, it's the same thing. If you don't understand that what I'm going to show you about the four foundations of mindfulness, you don't understand the value of them. You can't unless you're doing this all the time and experimenting with it, okay? So let's get into it here. Um, eventually, you want to be free from suffering. You're hanging out with people who are, are thinking the same way. And um, we'll be motivated to proceed to whatever the next stage in our practice is as we go along and, and share with each other how this is happening or not. I have this thing that's hanging on me. Okay. And so uh, the first thing you want to do is, is practice the, um, the mind. You want to start by practicing the mind. You know, I'm sorry, I missed one. No, body feel, I'm sorry, body. You want to, but why are you doing this whole thing? Why are you going to go into the four foundations anyway? What you're after, now look at these, when you write these five points down, write them down and look at your twin practice and see if you are fulfilling this. So first you're doing it to purify your mind. When you practice the steps of the six R's of right effort, are you purifying your mind so that you, you purify your mind? The second one is to overcome sorrow and lamentation. Sorrow and lamentation is the suffering. To overcome that, when you're practicing uh, the twim, if something is disturbing you, then you are never minding that. Let go, relax, smile, and come back. That's all it is. Let go relax, smile, and come back. And the moment you recognize it, you teach your mind, just never mind that, never mind that, let it go, okay? So that's overcoming the sorrow and the su that's the suffering. Now, to put an end, the third one is to put an end to mental or physical stress. What are you doing in the six steps of your right effort that you're practicing what are you doing in those steps that would make you end the mental and physical stress? And what it is, is you're relaxing and smiling and coming back instead of staying tight and tightening up your mind and getting all concerned or taking things personally, you're letting it go, relaxing and coming back. The fourth one is to attain higher knowledge and insight about how everything actually works. That's the next one, okay? And the last one is to realize Nibbana or experience enlightenment, which is an opening of the mind. And um, I wish I had my pen, let's uh, and show you this. Uh, we have fine-tuned in our mind in this retreat, the five of us that are here, we have, we have fine-tuned very clearly what happens when a person goes through nibbana and they come out of it of the into cessation they come out and experience an opening then what's left what is happening so i want you to draw a, a picture draw a, a line from the left to the right of your page and on the uh, the left side uh, you put a B and on the right side, you put a D. Now we've done this lots of times. This is birth at one end, death at the other. So the line is your life line. Your life continuum line is that line. And then you put a little circle on the line, just a little like bead on it. And that's how old you are. Wherever you are on that, you put the little bead on the line and that's where you sit 
And what I usually do, you have always seen me draw a little car that is moving in the direction of death. <laughs> okay, everybody is moving in the direction towards the death. The moment you're born, you start to die is the idea of human beings in the body and everything. And so you're in this little car and you're moving along. And the problem for your suffering is you leave the trunk open. And when something happens on the line that's upsetting, a lot of times you will take that and you will put it in the trunk of the car, carry it with you. Yeah, but it already happened. And so you're denying that it already happened and it's finished back here. You see, you're carrying it with you. And then you start to think about it and you feel bad. And I should have done this and I could have done this. And that's the agony of the past. Shoulda, coulda, woulda, woulda, itis. The infection of thinking what I should have, I could have, or I would have done. But it's past. And that stuff that is behind the car, okay, the energy of those events is over. It's all used up. It's gone. So if you are sitting in the car thinking about one of them, you are using up the energy of your car in the present moment. True? Yeah, right. Okay. So now in front of you, you have another problem. In front of you, you have, what if this happens? What if that happens? And you're worried about the future so much. It's like you have a sack that's sitting in the front of the car. And if you start thinking too much about it, you just, hook it onto the car and, and try to push it as you go. But you know what? You are not in the future yet. And the future sits in front of you until you're there. Should you give away your energy living here in the present time in the car? You don't want to give it the, the energy to the future when you don't even know if that's going to happen. So this is the, this is the what if itis. The, the uh, irritation of the, oh, what if this happens? Uh oh, what if that happens? But what if that happens and you can't work because you're thinking about this bad thing, bad thing. So you want to stay in the car. So we were talking about this and one of the people said, you know, when you get to the path and you go down and you go through a cessation from everything you're describing to me, it sounds like when you come back out, You've emptied your trunk and you took the sack off the front of the car and threw it away. And you erase anything you have concerned in the future and you erase anything you have in the back. And the only thing that's left is this little car that you're sitting in. And it moves through life in the, and you're in the present time. But there's no pressure on you at all. None. None. You know, I lost... Um, I don't know, 60 files or something out of a folder the other day. And I, I always have this funny thing, you know, a, a long time back, about 20 years ago, I had a stroke that affected memory loss. I was ready to throw the talent. I'm no use to anybody anymore, anywhere. I had kingpin type positions, office manager positions in Washington, D.C., and was in controlling everything, you know. And then you shut me down and say, I can never, ever multitask again because short-term memory is gone. I give May a file. She turns around by the time she gets to the desk. She has no idea why she has it in her hand. <laughs> Somebody gives you notes in the morning. You have time to look at them in the, in the early afternoon and you have no idea what they mean. Even though the person talked to you, you forget everything. For some reason, I can remember the Dhamma. That's all we have to worry about here. <laughs> okay. And I figure I could succeed at helping you with the Dhamma because it's only one subject, one set of information. And as long as I don't go out here and try and bake a cake or scrub, do almost anything else, I can get through and give you the answers to what you need. So it's like a gift, you see? So the idea was we came up with some little analogies you can think about. What does it mean? What happens to you when you go into cessation and then you come out again and you feel lighter because you don't have the past and the weight of the future anymore on you? 
probably. Okay, but you feel really cleaned out, you know, and very bright. Okay, and when you feel bright like that, and why is it that your eyes are seeing sharper and you just don't even need your glasses anymore for a few hours? What, why? Why can you hear so sharply or smell so precisely or taste so directly when this kind of a thing happens to you? Why? What's happening? And I think that they really found something because if you're just sitting in the little car, they said to me, I think it's like a newborn brain. I think you threw away all the stuff from your past and all the stuff from your future. And here you are. Now, when you leave the retreat and you go home, why doesn't it last? Well, it's pretty easy because you forget the basics is you're not supposed to carry that stuff again and pick it up. And after a few days, you wonder, but I remember, and you start thinking about what's in the past and feeling bad about it, or you're looking in the future saying, oh, I think I still need to worry about this because this could happen or that can happen. And what will I do here? And then you start again and you start loading up the car. See? But the trick to this thing is you look at the little car analogy, you can have a very nice ride through life if you stay in that car. And you don't, you've closed the trunk and there's no hooks on the front of the car. You can't hook anything on the front of the car. And you're absolutely a clean ride and you know you're going through life one step at a time. The idea of the present moment is hypothetical fad, in my opinion. Because right now, today, we're talking about science. We've gone to nanoseconds, which are part of moments, which are parts of seconds, which are part of minutes, which are part of hours. And if you have a watch on, you know perfectly well you can't even stay in a second. But and a very advanced meditator, I will tell you that's true. They can see the moment, moment, moment going by, but not us, not, not the people who are starting in the beginning. Let's start with the realization of the middle. Then we can look at what's really tiny if you want to go in the brain and see how fast this is all moving. Or you can look broadly and across lifetimes if you want to look at the gross, the macrocosmic view of this whole thing and look at that in philosophical philosophical terms, you can take a look at that. But for you, for going through life, how do I feel better now? What's in the past? You know, put it away. <laughs> What's in the future? Put it away and take a look at what is happening between the morning and the evening when you go to work and you are working. See what you find is there. That's what you do. So here, my questions were with these five pieces, did you fulfill, can sit, does TWIM, is it, is it helping you to purify your mind? Yeah. Is it helping you to overcome sorrow and lamentation or the suffering? Yes, because you're gaining the knowledge of how it works. The knowledge is what sets you free, you see? The knowledge is, is what sets you free when you apply it, but it isn't anything if you read it or if I just tell it to you, it isn't anything. So even if I know everything and I tell you, a guru, a teacher, or God, it's nothing until you actually live it. Then it gets into you and starts to change your mind. You have to use it or you, you cannot keep it is what this is. Third one was put an end to mental and physical stress. Yeah. The next one, attain higher knowledge and have it turn into insight. And insight, what do insights mean? Insights are meaning in our practice, we don't start to calm down, then come out and say we're ready to have insights. During the practice, we know these two were two uh, components of one practice that was being done by him. And we had a lengthy discussion yesterday with this group about why are we saying this? And we're depending on Rice Davies, okay? Rice Davies was the pronounced expert on the language and when it happens and how it evolved for Polly and the old, you know, to, there's different levels of Polly, different kind, not kinds, but different Polly's that are, are different sets of words. And this all came about. And one thing that bothered him about the history of the word samadhi 
was when did they decide to cancel out the use of ekagata and try to tell us that samadhi meant concentration? Why did they do that? He's wanting to know. And you find this, the remarks he made about this, you have to go to Rice Davies dictionary and look at, up the word samadhi and see what he said about this. And he said, the thing about samadhi, he began to think this word, it doesn't belong here uh, because it belongs here with the Buddha, but it was never there before the Buddha. And before the Buddha came, ekagata was the word. But then when the Buddha comes, then samadhi shows up. And he says to himself, you know, if I was somebody and I figured the way in and I knew how to open the mind completely and I was going to teach other people how to do this after I learned how to do it, I would certainly name that practice something else other than a concentration practice. So it's, it's not just, the, uh, just us saying to you that, uh, you know, um, what he did was not an absorption concentration. It's, there's other points that you can prove by looking into the whole thing. You see, it tells you right in the, in the suttas that the samatha and the vipassana, right? The serenity and the insight were two components of one practice. And the two parts were yoked evenly together. So now today we don't know much about that, but yokes, you know, here are two cows and the cows are going to pull the wagon. So we build a yoke between them and we hook them together. They're harnessed together now and they're pulling the wagon together in order to pull it through the, to the cessation for you to open your mind, they have to be yoked evenly together and trained to work as a team to pull the wagon through the gate. That's what we have to remember. Okay, let's do the four pieces. The first one, we look at the four foundations of mindfulness involves the cultivation of the mindfulness in regards to you paying attention or observing, observing the body, observing feelings is the second one, observing mind or mental states is the third part. And the fourth part is observing Dhamma, which is individual arising thoughts and you know insights and thoughts and things like that that come up in the mind. And as we become mindful of our body, we naturally become aware of our feelings. So where do we go to get the answer to this is in one of the, I left my book in the other room, but I'm not gonna go get it. Um, in the two suttas, number Majima Nikai, number 43, and uh, I think it's Chula Vidala Sutta and Maha Vidala Sutta, 43 and 44, you're going to find sets of questions and answers about the Dhamma. And one of the things is about the body and how do we watch the body? How are we become aware of the body? What do we do? And that's where she says, that's where you are watching, you are seeing the body and seeing what happened, how the body moves and you're aware there is a, a body or here, a shell around you. In, around the uh, that is the structure of the body. You see it because when you breathe in, you see it, and you breathe out, you see it. Whether it's long or short, or whether it's rough or smooth, whether it's bumpy or smooth like that, you watch and you see the movement of the body, and that's what that's for. It wasn't something to be concentrating on because we find out later that the object of the meditation is not what you are supposed to be concentrating on. You are supposed to be watching what happens in the mind. Now, why did the Buddha focus on the mind? Why, why was he watching mind? I wanted to know that a few months ago and it's pretty simple when you, you know, boil it all down and to the bottom answer down here in this uh, like deductive reasoning and you get to the bottom, okay? You want to know, uh, go and examine mind because mind is the forerunner of all states. All states of mind come from up the mind and the body follows whatever the mind is doing. 
how do I know that? Because I used to work in hospitals and if you went into the emergency room and someone was almost in a state of shock, if someone could make eye contact with the person and calm their mind down, their blood pressure would go down, their heart rate would go down, the stability of the systems in the body would come back as best they could. And then you could give the person medication needed to get them into an operating room to save them. So there's definitely, there was this connection between the mind and the body and the Buddha decides, well, look, if that's true, uh, we've been torturing our body in many different ways. You can go to, um, I think I'm right, May, you can check, but I think it's Majima Nikai number 12 is where the account of all the different things that the Buddha tried to do and it failed. And it didn't take him to enlightenment. But at the time when he was living, people had this idea, if we torture the body with enough pain, the only thing uh, that will be left is, is just the mind will just open. They thought this connection was like that. And it wasn't. It wasn't like that. And so it was, he was not successful, like uh, with breathing until there was no other breath left, or denying food until he turned into a skeleton, or, uh, you know, um, not sleeping at all, things like this, detriment, you know, um, but to, denying the body, sleep or food or air is not going to help you open the mind. In the end, what was the condition of the Buddha when he sat under the tree and became awake? If you go back and figure out in the story, he had already almost killed himself and he comes back and starts to eat and he takes a bath and restores himself and he probably slept for a while too because he'd been denying himself lots of sleep. Then he comes back, puts his body in, in shape again, then he sits under the tree, then he gets his mind, his mind opens up. This is very important. So these things, these, these uh, you know, uh, what you go through with that sort of thing, that kind of practice and everything, there is a kind of discipline, isn't there, involved? Yeah. And you're following the instruction of the teacher. Yeah. And you're going as far as you actually can. But it didn't go to where he wanted it to go. It's not going to happen. And Rigpa, for instance, is not the same as the Nibbana. It is not the same and doesn't have the same results as the opening has. And the, you know, so it was more about that. So anyway. Okay. So you have body is first and feeling, he says, because you become mindful of your body, we naturally begin to become aware of our feelings. How does it feel? You know, and that's how we're watching the feeling arising, existing and passing away. And when you're seeing that, what are you seeing? You are realizing the three characteristics all the time. Every time you practice TWIM, you are learning the three characteristics and the four noble truths. You write down the four noble truths and then write down the three characteristics and then write down the instructions for twin beside it. Then you start examining what is causing you to fulfill and understand the three characteristics and four noble truths. So then as you become aware of your feelings, you naturally become aware of your states of mind. And so then you look at, you're watching your state of mind. And in the sutta, in uh, Satipatthana and Mahasatipatthana, one of the biggest things it's emphasizing to you is this is not me, it is not mine, it is not myself. And so with feeling, this is not me, it is not mine, it is not who I am. It is just what is, a, is not there, is arising, is existing, is passing away. That's what you keep repeating when you're in 111 and the Anupada is showing you how Sariputta realizes these things when there is nothing there, it arises, it exists there, and then it passes away. You are learning Anicca and you are also learning the impersonal nature of, the, of what is happening. 
then mind, when you're watching the feelings, then we begin to understand and realize the, uh, uh, the, um, the states of mind. And as our mindfulness on the mind develops, we begin to understand and realize the aspects of the Dhamma at an experiential level. Now, these, the, Mahinda was a uh, forest uh, monk, and he had some exposure to some great master teachers, not just Keshe Ramananda. And he spent a lot of time in the forest testing everything, and he's coming to explain to you how this is working. And this is how the four foundations of mindfulness lead us towards the liberation. So the mindfulness of the body is Anupanasati, as I told you used to calm the person down and realize the structure of the body. That's what it's for. The, to get to the proper level of samatha so that you can see clearly and watch how things are happening without being disturbed. That forms the first technique for the cultivation of the mindfulness of the body. And then when it's done with the proper guidance, it's very effective in raising the consciousness of the body to a very high level, such as in the development of being able to go into where the jhanas are. Now, he was actually practicing some in the absorption for a while in his in his practice as well. But he's saying this helps you to get into the jhanas, and it does. If your body is calm and the samatha has calmed you down, it's the first step to being still and not moving at all, and then going into your practice, okay? So it includes mindfulness of the body. It covers the postures, the clear comprehension of any bodily activities, awareness of these activities. But when you are moving, your uh, full awareness is actually on the higher level, what is my mind doing while I am doing a physical action with my body? That was the higher understanding in the mindfulness of the body. When I walk from the door of the house to the car, am I actually only walking or am I thinking of what I have to do when I get into the car and into the office? This is the kind of thing it's talking about. Can you actually take a walk and only walk? It doesn't mean you stare at your feet and follow your feet and walk very slow and all of that. It's not about that. It's about can you just eat your food and not have anything else going in your mind and simply eat your food or chew your food and not start the mind calculating and running away. It's a practice of discipline for refining doing only one thing at a time. Very good for piano students. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> any, any instrument it's good for. So there are these other aspects of mindfulness, the body uh, that support it and include, these include mindfulness of the posture you're sitting in and taking care about comprehension of when you're doing an activity, what is your mind doing? And the four basic elements in the body, how does this work with the body, the liquid, the solid, um, the heat of the body, and, um, and the wind in the body? Can you sense it? It's becoming uh, aware fully of the body, but also aware of the 32 parts inside the body. All of these things have to do with the body contemplation. Then the next one is feeling, and feeling is mindfulness of the body naturally will lead you to the development of feeling. And here we just are developing the ability to distinguish between three kinds of feeling. And that's all you need is the three kinds of feeling are basically a pleasant feeling, a painful feeling, and a neutral feeling. Now, when you hear people talking about hundreds of different kinds of feelings, well, it's a multiplication game, okay? You have six ways of setting off contact before feeling arises. You have your eyes, your ears, your nose, your tongue, and your body, and then your mind, right? So when you make contact with a sight, a sound, an odor, a taste, or a tangible sensation of touching, right? Or a thought in your mind, okay? That's multiplying these six kinds of feelings, six times 
Oh, six, okay, three kinds of feeling and six sense doors is 18 kinds of feeling, you see? So now also then you can multiply again to 36 kinds by simply saying that mental feeling about what is being seen or physical feeling about what's being seen. And then you've got 36 kinds. So this is the game you play in Abhidhamma to, to idolize, you know, I make an itinerary of every single feeling that can happen. But I'm saying what we're doing with tranquil wisdom insight meditation is taking you to the place where you, only what you need to identify clearly what it means by path and how to get on the path and move down the path to experience cessation and then come out of that and experience Nibbana. We're trying to take it. That's what foundation teaching is all about. That's what the whole thing was about. Okay, now the next one is mindfulness of mind. And mindfulness of mind through the cultivation of mindfulness of feelings, we will develop a greater sensitivity to our mind and mental states. So when the mind is restless or it's confused, uh, we are aware and we, when there is a lustful desire or a, what desire to get attached to something and preoccupied with it, so you can't even think about anything else or get things done. This is the problem with the lust side or anger and aversion where you constantly getting disturbed by this will not stop, whether it's something in life or the office or whatever. And this practice enables us to step out of the unwholesome states of mind, providing space for positive action to take the place of it. So as to overcome any unwholesome or negative states of mind, the secret to change in any meditation that you are doing is when you let go of something, you always replace it with the wholesome. When you let go of an unwholesome, you never leave a hole. We've had talks about this and the universal law is you cannot leave a vacuum where there was something there and expect it to ever change. What you threw away will come right back. We were, we've been using this one lately saying, oops, here it is, the hindrance, it's here. Now we throw it away and we don't put anything in the hole. So what comes back before the end of the day is hello, here's the hindrance again. And it's the same one and it's bothering you the same way. And as soon as you realize that this is happening again and again in the same way, you know that you are not doing something right. And this is where right effort comes in. Right effort was not throwing it away, seeing it's unwholesome and throwing it away. That's not what it was. It was seeing that something is wrong and throwing that away, letting it go, not throwing it away. Don't say throw, <laughs> letting it go, releasing it, relaxing your mind and your body will follow. Coming back as you smile and come back, your smile immediately replaces it. So it can't come back in the hole really fast. And then your practice of your meditation becomes the real wholesome one because it's the most wholesome thing you can be doing in life. And when the mind is well-focused and you're, you're using it properly, we know that it is concentrated in a way where it is productive concentration, not too tight and not too loose. Eventually, we also learn to differentiate between and, and become mindful at different levels of what's going on, something light in, in life to something serious when something's happening that's a big thing, or for meditation for one particular way for a period of time. We learn to control the level of our attention and our observation. So when mindfulness on the mind is well established, it naturally leads to the cultivation of mindfulness on the Dhamma. And the mindfulness on the Dhamma, okay, it means many things. Now, these Dhammas in the context of this observation that you're doing in 
your meditation, there are five aspects of Dhamma that are involved. And this, I really like the way he broke this down and pinpointed it. Five mental hindrances, which we already talk about, five aggregates, six sense doors or six sense bases, whatever way they're talking about it, seven factors of enlightenment, balancing of them, but first meet and greet each one and then see how they work together on the seesaw, on the balancing seesaw. And then the last one is the Four Noble Truths. And I would have put another one in there, the three characteristics, because that's being revealed to you constantly through this whole thing. And the five hindrances are sensual desire, first one, anger or aversion, second one, sloth and torpor, third one, restlessness is the fourth one, and doubt. Those are the five. And as you practice, as soon as, as, as long as you replace it and with a wholesome, when you let go of it, they're not likely to come back. But also you have to have the knowledge of how the hindrance operates. If you don't have that, you could be caught in the dark night of the soul. We're here constantly forever for months upon months struggling with hindrances. And why would that happen if you knew one secret? Not a secret. It's actually in the text. Nobody sees it anymore. The food, the nutriment for the hindrance is my personal attention. So who makes me uh, suffer? Do you make me suffer? No, I make myself suffer from a lack of knowledge of how things are actually operating in the world. That seems to be the biggest problem, okay? Then the five aggregates were just body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness, okay? So we had the rupa, okay, the body, form, okay, vedana for the feeling, sanya for the perception, sankara for the formations that up, come up, and the consciousness was vinyana, okay? So you're trying to, uh, the five aggregates leads you when you start examining to the realization of the true nature of a self, Thus, you are breaking the idea of I and me and my and mine. And this is where the self begins to start to disintegrate because we understand there, that's not what is driving us through life. When mindfulness on the five aggregates is well established, then we turn to watching the sense doors. And when we did the foundation teaching here, what we did was we sent you out to spend some time with your sense doors, go to a park for the day, walk around for a while and examine how you see. How do your ears work? How does the nose work? How does the tongue taste when you're eating lunch? How does the body operate and how does the mind work? And do you manage this? Do you control this? Is this me and is it mine? What I see, hear, smell, taste, touch, or think, you see? And you discover it's not. It is an impersonal experience of this being, an impersonal experience. So you don't have to take it personally. When somebody it comes to speak to you about something, you do not have to take it on the defensive immediately. You can watch them in a movie in front of you and know that, you know, uh, you can see that they are, are taking it, everything personally and wanting to defend against you when you didn't even say anything to them. And this is crazy how this actually works. But you can watch them in a 
movie and understand you're in the audience. You do not have to react. You have a choice of watching instead and then taking them to get coffee or ice cream <laughs> and go sit down and talk about what's really happening. If they're upset about something, it's not about what they're saying or yelling toward you. They're probably speaking about themselves in the situation more likely. And probably what they say toward you, they're actually saying toward themselves. This is what seems to happen if we look more deeply at it. Seven factors of enlightenment, quickly those seven pieces, these we tell you, uh, they have to come into line, alignment in a balance, like a balance bar straight across before they can fall over into cessation. And the tendency of holding on is well under control uh, when you are watching the sense spaces, you're just holding on to the idea of how it actually is, and you're watching it. And the I, me, my, and mine, that's, that's disappearing, it's diminishing. One begins to get ready to embark on a path of enlightenment through the practice of the seven factors of enlightenment. Now we've been, we've been using them ever since we started meditation, but we've had to watch how much how much mindfulness are we using? How much investigation are we doing? How much energy is there? How much joy is coming up? How much tranquility is there, et cetera, and so forth. But now you're gonna develop them in a stronger way where they're gonna act for you. They're gonna operate correctly. And so these are the Sata Bojanga. They call the Sata Bojanga. And the seven factors of enlightenment uh, begins with mindfulness, which is an observation of what of how everything is working inside and you're observing and you're watching just to see what happens next. You are not doing anything or making anything come up. You are just going to watch to see what happens next. And as we develop the four foundations of mindfulness, we become able to clearly observe the rising and the falling of mental or physical phenomena. And the earlier that you see this happening, the faster you can know what to do, whether to just keep watching or let go, relax, smile, and come back. The Dhamma Achaya is the investigation of the Dhamma. And as, the, as they unfold, the faith or the confidence arises. And that, will, that which is the condition of the energy how much energy is there? And likewise, the other factors are gonna to begin to arise one after another. And finally, they get to Upeka, and this is the equanimity. Now the Four Noble Truths, I'm not gonna talk about a lot about those, but you see how the, when you're practicing, and this is where I wish I had my pen, because like I said to you, you take and you write the four, uh, noble truths on the side and the seven factors of enlightenment and the things we mentioned in body, feeling, mind, and dhammas. Then you write the steps of the of the six R's, and in your mind you go over. I recognize this, and uh, I see I I see what this is. Okay, and you you once you are watching this whole thing, you are observing it. So remember, we built it like this. We said this this triangle, like this, this triangle, is mindfulness. It is the observation, and we put the piece of the um, we put the, the the this on top, and we said this is the teeter daughter, or this is the seesaw. And we said on one side, we had investigation, energy, and joy. And on the other side, we had tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. And one side of this seesaw, one side of it, it has a lot of energy operating it. On the other side, there is a diminishment of this. And you want to get it so that it basically, it's going to, it's going to be staying uh, you know, even like this, and it's not going to be like that or like that with no energy and inertia and no observation and everything falls apart or is too much energy and joy, 
I agree with Bonte. Joy is like how much you put in. You don't go straight face. Don't go straight face in your practice. Keep a little bit of a smile. And Sarma, you better be smiling a little bit. Uh huh. <laughs> you better be smiling a little bit, okay? When you're practicing, and the moment you keep that smile in place, this this uh, this uh, muscle here from the corners, it's not just here. It runs up to the corner of the eye, and now we know it runs inside to separate these two a little bit and allow your pineal gland to operate. And that is in uh, gee whiz, all kinds of mysticism, meditation in the history of mankind, this pineal gland, this little thing that is shaped like this, it is shaped just like, we can see that, but see the little shape like that. It's like a teardrop. It's sort of like a pine cone shape, they say. Even at the um, in the um, in Rome in the Vatican, there is a big statue of a pine cone outside, and everybody wants to know what is the pine cone sitting there for, and that represents the pineal gland opening up and allowing the person to feel uplifted joy and let everything go, let everything fall away. And so that's what you're attempting to do. And in, in my opinion, I see this, you know, that the, uh, the right effort when we put it back together again and we're doing it properly, that's what sets us free. That's what leads us to a place and opening, okay? So that's what I wanted to tell you today about that and help you to understand that we are, we are fulfilling the lessons you need to learn in Satipatthana. Yeah, Sarma. In the beginning, mm -hmm. it was told that we are not suffering our lives. We are suffering with our capabilities of memory and uh, imagination. That's, That's true. What you conveyed. Yeah. There are the capabilities, the faculties which we human beings have. These are the two capabilities, uh, memory and uh, imagination. Next. Eka Samadhi, even that was there before uh, Buddha also. No, no. Okay, according to Rice Davies, it wasn't there. You can go back and look. He's like. No, no, because it was used in the Upanishads uh, before written. Uh, it was, they were written before uh, Buddha. Uh -huh. But okay. Samadhi was misinterpreted after. Yoga, yoga Sutras in uh, 2nd BC, 200 BC. Yoga, yeah, okay. Uh, yoga okay. Sutras, they are misinterpreted with absorptions. That's that's right, yeah. Asmita Samadhi and other uh, Nirvikalpa yeah. Samadhi, uh, those things were there. There, the Samadhi is a Sanskrit word. That was there before Buddha also. But Rice David interpretation was different. Uh, of course, we cannot accept totally uh, uh, no, it was uh, Rice Davies was putting forth a hypothesis on the situation, mm -hmm. and this was long before we were doing TWIM. This mm -hmm. this uh, dictionary was written, and we were interested to find it because mm -hmm. he was leaning in the same direction. You mm -hmm. see, as mm -hmm. we were with mm -hmm. the quality of the of the um, the quality of the concentration. You see. The yeah. quality of concentration because of Yoga Sutras, it was misinterpreted. Okay. Uh, that is correct. And second, Ekagrata, Ekagrata is a Sanskrit word. Uh, again, uh, that is also there earlier and how to use it practically was not known to the people. After Buddha only, that Ekagrata, after Tivim only, I can say that I have understood the point. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. But in the yoga, su yoga sutras would be concentrating on each position and concentrating very hard and very using, hard. Mm -hmm. yeah, and using and, a kagata in that sense doesn't uh, allow you to open. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That ever jhanas are, are giving us a lot of uh, explanation and uh, uh, practical aspects, uh, ever jhanas are give, providing when compared to yoga sutras. The yoga yeah. sutra. Yoga mm -hmm. Sutra Samadhis are uh, like absorptions and uh, they will be temporary in nature and afterwards uh, 
they will go off and our uh, four hindrances uh, five hindrances will come into play in, in as a major role <laughs> that's that right is the drawback because of uh, yoga sutras they were not able to explain properly that's right so with the pointed mind concentrating on something that makes it so uh, the hindrances arise to come against you and then when you you when you hold them down, apply the application to the hindrances themselves to press them down, they pop up. And I think one thing Delson did that uh, if you're listening to Delson, uh, aren't uh, you know aren't strong at all? You know, if you're listening to Delson, one of his descriptions was just great. You know, you're in a swimming pool and you have a ball, you're playing with the kids, you know, a beach ball and you push it underneath the, and then, and then as soon as you let go of it to get out of the pool, it comes up and pops up yes. out of the water. The simile, the metaphor, the what we used is correct. Yeah. Mm. That is a very precise a uh, little way of explaining what happens if you try to suppress a hindrance and make it stop. You can't uh, later, do it. Later on, they included uh, in the dictionary, Pali dictionary, but uh, uh, the collectedness uh, for the samadhi, collectedness meaning for the samadhi. Earlier, it was not there. Right. Now they'll say that could be there. Mm. But, uh, the but collectedness uh, has come because of the uh, both uh, samatha and insight. Uh, after tasting the both the both the aspects only, they wrote collectedness. That's <laughs> <laughs> everybody's trying to make. Oh, earlier, earlier <laughs> also under confused a lot of confusion with the uh, Patanjali Yoga Sutras, but uh, Rishikesh it was taught uh, by Shivananda Ashram yeah. for me uh, way back in, uh, in uh, 2016. After coming to Twim only, the real taste is uh, taste has come. Yeah. Uh, the of, uh, otherwise, I was <laughs> I was under the five, five hindrances. That five hindrances are uh, bombarding me like anything. Ah, uh, and then you found that I remember you came to the first retreat we did over in um, 2018. Yeah, with Mall, right, right. Yeah, with Mall. So it was an eye-opening thing to consider handling it a different way. And then you found out, yeah, this is if this is how they actually work. And you go into the uh, Bojanga Samyutta in the, um, you know, in the Samyutta Nikaya, you go into the Bojanga Samyutta to about by about 1,000, uh, what is it, 15, 1,597, or there's a section in there on called the discussions. And the yes. first discussion that mm. is given in that section of the Bojanga is basically, um, you know, the um, it, it is the uh, the nutriment of a hindrance, uh, the nutriment and the denutriment of a hindrance in direct relationship to the arising or the non-arising of the seven factors of enlightenment. If you read that discussion, it tells you very precisely about um, wise action and unwise action or wise paying attention wisely or unwisely and what happens to the uh, enlightenment factors. And so you know you can't, you, you have to have a this balance, you have to understand, this is telling you exactly how a hindrance arises. The other spot that I found that was telling you immediately what is the problem, immediately in one sentence, is Majima Nikai number 22 in, in section six, I think it's section six, where it basically says uh, he's talking to the monk and the monk believes that it's okay to pay attention to the hindrance engage the hindrance. And the Buddha is trying to correct him. And he says, how many times have I hold you, told you? And he's, say, he's, he's angry with the monk. He's saying, why aren't you listening to me? How many times have I told you that if you, um, the only way an obstacle can become an obstruction in your meditation is if you personally engage in it. You have to engage it. So of course you always have one smart student out of 40 that's gonna to say to you, and what does it mean to engage? <laughs> Mataji, I will tell you one thing. As long as we don't understand our five aggregates, 
whether it may be any tradition. We can't understand the ekagrata, whatever you said, the collectedness and aware jhanas. That's right. And we will not never we will never be in the correct path. That's right. But it's not as complicated as they make it sometimes, having whole entire retreats on body feeling, mind and dhammas. It isn't particularly necessary to get that much involved if you're told the front principles of knowledge that you need on each piece. You see what I mean? They have turned it into an agonizing kind of necessary kind of special retreat where we concentrate so much on this and this and this and this. But we find that if we tell this, if the students learn when we're teaching them, that if we give them the key piece of knowledge about each piece, it's enough. It is enough. And so we see the people able to move down and experience the path. And, and the, we had so many hints in the last month, finding out things like uh, one monk coming to Sariputta and saying, well, how long does it take to do this? And he turns to him and he said, says, not long, friend, not long. And this because, sorry, Putin took only two weeks, you know, but he was very precisely following the instructions and watching step by step what was happening. He wasn't bringing anything else in to try to do this. That's the key part. We run into mostly people coming from another practice insisting I'm still going to do this. Or if you say, you know, let go, relax, I'll come back. I'm going to let go. Relax means it took me five or 10 minutes because I had to start here and go all the way down through my whole body. And, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and you're there. Wait a minute. I, I actually explained to you that if you relax this, this will follow. You can practice it on the floor, get on a mat, check, have somebody check your heart rate and relax your mind and see if you relax your mind as your heart rate come down. You, you can do this stuff yourself now. You can check it to see if I'm telling you the truth or not, yeah? <laughs> the, main the main deviation in the entire literature of Hinduism or any other sect or any other tradition is only five aggregates of clinging. Once uh -huh. they understand the five aggregates of clinging, they can think about the four noble truths. Okay, Otherwise, now, if the I'm five gonna, aggregates are not understood. And now, now, I want you to listen to something you just said. Mm. So you, I want you to catch this is English. Mm. And this is a glitch. We call it <laughs> glitch. Tiny, it's a glitch. Okay. You just said if they just understand the uh, five aggregates of clinging. Mm. Now, is that true? Or if or is the problem of suffering bit? Watch this. Is the pro, right, Here's the question. Are your aggregates, do they cause clinging? And the answer is no, no. Also, but the, way, but the way that you just said it, aggregates of clinging means to an English speaking person that the aggregates are causing suffering. They are causing that, clinging. They're, it's their fault. But my body yeah. is not causing me suffering. No, that's not mm. it. See? So when you suffering. go back, you go back and refine this. The mm. uh, the um, the aggregates when clinging, or the aggregates if clinging cause suffering. That suffering. is correct. Okay. That is correct. Two in, in small addition, words. Yeah. Yes. Also, also, the because you are in uh, Mumbai and uh, you have been interacting with the people for the last two two years or two and a half years. The main fallacy of the philosophies developed in India are based on identity, the myself, I-ness, including uh, Advaita Vedanta, Advaita philosophy or anything if you take into consideration, I-ness is there. E even so many things what he speaks in the uh, Delson also, the Yoga Vasisha or any other Upanishads, only self-identity is there. When self-identity is coming, the five aggregates he cannot understand. The, the suffering of the mind he will not understand. So that it is, is only right. deviated from there. That That's too, right. particularly, particularly from the from the base of nothingness, every every tradition is deviated. But this particular base of nothingness, the correct 
procedure or path is known only from the PIM? Well, nothingness is a difficulty for people for a number of reasons. You get somebody who was in charge of the whole company and had to take care of everything and you put him in a meditation class and he gets to nothingness, he goes crazy. And he's gonna keep popping out and coming to several interviews in each retreat for maybe as long as five years because I can't stay there because nothing is there. <laughs> and in this addition, whole entire life. Yeah, this was the playground for me. And I had to do something. <laughs> also, 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 Mataji, uh, when you're dealing with particular Indians, they differ, sunyata, they can't understand. They don't know nothingness. And uh, Mahayana brought out that emptiness. So all these words, they get confused. It is, it is only at the base of nothingness, everything you should understood in a proper way and proceed further in the correct path. Every, we talk, every, you know, every, uh, here's every tradition did, stopped there only. Nothing I else. understand. Now, let me show you. Last night, I did teach nothing. I taught, I taught the uh, 121 is the Chula Shunyata Sutta. I taught. And the last verse, yeah, I tried to tell them in the beginning, I want you to listen to this sentence. Mm. And I told them the sentence in the beginning before I taught them the sutta. I said, listen for this sentence, because when this is no longer there, this is present. That is the key to the Chula Sunyata Sutta, because he is the, this is when you listen to the Sutta, you are trying to listen, does the Buddha teach emptiness? And the answer is no. He doesn't teach in, in, uh, any emptiness. He teaches that when you are empty of the village and it's not in your mind anymore and you're, you're, em you're, you're void of the forest, void means empty of. Void of means it's not there anymore. I am void of the city, void of the forest, void of the earth, looking at the earth, void of the first, second, third, fourth, jhana and void of each one after that and so in the very end he says to ananda and as to what i am void of that then this is present you see that one yeah you see that particular greed delusion and hatred there they misinterpreted well greed hatred and delusion uh, that, uh, are three, just uh, off uh, emptiness of those three yeah, but Buddha, Buddha taught uh, emptiness of those three only. That's right. But uh, every tradition misinterpreted from there in a different way using Ines. But we have to be I kind. I want to point something out to you now. Hmm. You have to be kind to Nargajuna. And why should you be kind to Nargajuna who started the school of emptiness? Because of Kalupahana. You go and read Professor Kalupahana's book about Nargajuna, you will begin to understand that he, the same as Buddhaghosa, was living in a particular time when everything was in dispute. And so if you find out the political situation when emptiness began with Nargajuna, you are very likely to discover that he, they needed something desperately that would pull them away into one place to be united and not for Buddhism to disappear. And Kalupahana spent 71 years looking at, he did many, many, many books, okay. But his real two things that were the itch for him that he wanted to spend his life on was Buddhaghosa. And Buddhaghosa comes in at a time when four factions are fighting over what the Buddha said. And the elders are looking at a four-way split in Buddhism that could destroy it. And they're frightened. So his job was not to come in and author a work about the uh, what the Buddha did, his job was to come in and be a compiler of 126 things and show how they sort of worked together. And that's how things got all messed up because he couldn't sort out the meditation. And the most influence he had was from growing up a Brahmin and, and meditating this way. So everything leans that way. It must mean that what they said means this. It must mean. Now, I didn't believe that, but I'll tell you when I got to believing that was when we were in Korea 
in South Korea. We went to a place for Bonte to give a talk. And um, the, the, the person who was the head of the temple said, I've done something special for you. I have brought in the chief translators from the university to translate for you. Now they were not practicing TWIM and they were gonna translate for Bonte to give a talk. What's the problem with that? <laughs> and in a matter of minutes, one of the students said, please let me do this instead of this person because this person is translating meditation to mean something else and mindfulness to mean something else and concentration to mean something else. And this is not what the monk is teaching. And so she let this 18 year old student who had been to two of our retreats come in and she could translate beautifully. So what did we learn? We learned you cannot have someone over here in Asia to translate for us, no matter how good of a translator they are, because they will jump to translate the key words in our practice with the old definitions, the other definitions everybody seems to be using and they believe they're doing a good job. And if we don't catch it, that's why we're so that's why we're so slow in getting people to translate this. That's why, you see? Yeah. So these key pieces make it work or not work. That that is what happens. That's what's going on. Yeah? Okay. So that's Thank a you. good input. How about you Ever? What are you doing now? How are you doing? Okay, doing well. Oh, I, I'm doing well. I just uh, practically I just finished moving into a new apartment. So, um. <laughs> do you do you have the popcorn or whatever ready? <laughs> Are you going to oh. celebrate now? <laughs> <laughs> Is it okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's 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 okay. It's uh it's a nice place, and uh, I've, I, it's been a, a a challenge to um, to combine moving with with working and meditation um yeah i actually uh felt like uh, uh asking a question about that one so well my question to you is if that's a question my question is were you meditating while you were moving and while were you meditating while you're working so well, not very not worrying about sitting meditation formal meditation forget it when you're moving or you're having to travel across the country and do and set up someplace else the big question is are you seeing sitting down and saying what do i know about meditation and then using it integrated with what you're doing as you're moving well yeah uh that happened not, not continuously but you know at, at it, it just it it, uh, it pops up again like that's that's working in that way like when i'm painting like why am i not having fun painting this is I mean, this is, <laughs> yeah yeah it's, yeah right so uh so it, that's w working in that way and sometimes uh you know with a bit of a delay but uh yeah and I, you, know, you know i once had to help my sister-in-law to get an old house and then rebuild it upstairs for her kids when she was pregnant with her second baby they needed an extra room and so we went in the room we put diapers on and tied them on us we had lots of diapers in those days <laughs> you know type wrapping our heads in diapers and putting a big hat on and we had to rip out all of the walls by hand underneath was the traditional old you know from the early 1800s the batting before they do the plastering so we're pulling all the plaster down on the floor and then we have to pull the batting rip it all out and pry it out with crowbars through the whole house and then we have to clean up that entire room throw it all out the window into a trailer piece by piece and then we have to vacuum and can completely clean that room out and then after that we have to put new wall up on this on the on the wood and the wood was not rotten the wood was gray it was 110 years old the house was great and so we get the get the new wall up then we have to do the spackling that takes you know a whole week to take this wall down tear it apart put it outside clean up put the new wall up and then by the time we were painting we were there whoopee <laughs> we're painting 
and we were laughing in a course and 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 we had we had lots of sense of humor about new paints because you know obviously when you get frustrated why do i not like painting there's somebody else painting you throw the paint at them they throw the paint at you we have a food fight we have a paint fight <laughs> So we were, we keep a sense of humor. And the thing to remember about anything you have to do, like I told May when she moved that time, you know, no matter what you have to do when you move, okay, you remember Anicca. Always remember Anicca is your friend because if you're, you're tired of it and you don't want to talk about it and you just dropped it or something else, you know, you, whatever you're doing, you started it, it has a middle and it has an end. So Anicca is your friend. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you have to look at the sense of humor of this. It's true, isn't it? You, it wasn't happening and then you made it happen. Now it's basically over. Now you have some unpacking to do and a rearranging, but everything you're going to do in, in, a, in part of this moving just remember that, you know, if you don't like it, something's going to change later on, right? Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you have to have more of a sense of humor and, and laugh at the fact that you are irritated because I can remember the dog coming up and getting in that room and getting covered with all this stuff and then getting out of the room and going through the house on all the carpets and everything. And then we, Patty and I just sat there and just laughed at each other. This has got to be part of life. <laughs> I moved. I moved nineteen times in ten years, Everett. That's a lot. Wow. I was connected with the military, and I I moved nineteen times in ten years with the person I was married to, with the kids. <laughs> The early, if you have children and you're moving, uh, the advice is if they're very young, you set their room up first at the other end when you set up the house, get them in there with their toy box and make sure they can at least sleep inside the drawer of one of the dressers that you have in the room. Just make it into a little bed and put the child in there and then go do the rest in the house, you know, until you can find the crib. <laughs> You know, so I mean, how many times have you moved? How old are you? I, I'm I'm 30 years. I've only moved. This is my second time moving at all. Oh, you're a baby in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> and let me ask you a few pertinent questions. Does the toilet flush? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. is the water, does the water come naturally into the house? Yes, yes. Okay, so that's good. Do you have locks on the doors? It, it, it's all working. And the, and the water and the windows too, that's good. And the closets are okay, right? Right. And you checked, the boogeyman's not there, right? <laughs> <laughs> I checked, I, I didn't build the boogeyman in the closet, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they're under the bed, you gotta watch out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so you, you need to just have fun with all of this. And some of the places I moved, you would not believe. <laughs> you know, a dirt floored Quonset hut that's about 40 feet long and 20 feet wide in one big room, and you have to turn it into a house to live in. <laughs> you know, and just crazy things. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you just have fun. And you remember that the water doesn't always come here at night <laughs> okay, over here. So you're lucky you have the water and the toilet's another issue. <laughs> and um, yeah, dust is another issue. You seal every window in this place and you can still write your name in the floor by evening if you mopped it in the morning. You can write your name in the dust in the evening. <laughs> oh, uh... Be very privileged then uh, <laughs> this place yes okay so what you do with your practice is you apply it in everything that you do and you start looking at the reality of anicca and how it works and you also look at the nature of when you get up and there's no hot water because the geezer doesn't work or something and it's December, okay, that's fine. You imagine that it's hot water and you just wash or you get it on the stove if the stove's working. 
you're good if you have a gas stove, you can still get hot water. If the electric goes out, you're, you're bummed out, <laughs> you know? But it's like, uh, and you're in Germany, right? Uh, the Netherlands. Oh, so you're in the Netherlands, they, okay. They call us yes. swamp Germans, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But you have to keep, keep. Um, you have to look at it as a little child and more, not take it all seriously. And remember, whatever goes up comes down, and whatever moves will start, have a middle, and be finished the same way as something turning on and turning it off. And then you kind of remember these things, and you start laughing at the way that you are getting caught in craving. It's annoying you, this or that or the other. They didn't come to connect the phone yet, or they don't, you know, somebody doesn't have the address to deliver the groceries. <laughs> you don't know where the post office is, and suddenly they want you to mail something quickly. All kinds of things like that. I, I used to have a, I don't know where it is, but I used to have a book that we had somebody did in the military for moving and it was like a checklist and it we got us to remember absolutely everything and do it quickly so if we had to move we could move so yeah so now you're there and you got a smile yeah yeah <laughs> you want to put it to a question go ahead no that was pretty much it no that was that was all right thank you yeah okay yeah so Anicca no dukkha because of anatta. See that? Yeah. Anicca, we accept you as a friend. And the, the one thing I used to be involved in before Buddhism, the guy was kind of crazy and it was a, a, a different thing, but his he would come to the retreat and he would have us all stand there. And many of us had a lot of difficulty getting to these places. He would set these retreats up. The first night we were there, he would have us all there and he would take us, we'd all hold our arms up and we would all say, welcome upheaval meaning change is great and you grow from change and you learn new things. And so in this case, now you have the practice, you learn a Nietzsche, you learn how the Duke is working and you just keep substituting and uh, you know replacing it with the, with the steps of your right effort and you keep laughing. And you know, if, if you laugh, it gets, it gets over faster, doesn't it, May? <laughs> you keep laughing about it it's not always the best day moving you know but but um it usually gets gets over and when it's done then there's a new a new step yeah okay so that was really good <laughs> okay anybody else have a question all questioned out huh I'm guilty tonight. I don't have the bell to ring. So I'm going to have to go ding, ding. I don't have a bell to ring. <laughs> it's in the other room. So let's say our prayer for tonight. And I will see you next week. And I'm going to talk to you next week about taking a section of the uh, suttas and maybe going through a section of them. I was going to write you a note about this and, and see maybe maybe you, I want to go back to use the suttas directly and uh, do that but I want to have a set of them that we're going through. So you have any comments about this, write to me and tell me which ones, which kind or something uh, you would like to, to see. I wanted to definitely show you how he was teaching very up close and personal when he sets up his suttas and he teaches a lesson and then goes into it and gets out the other end. I wanted you to see how he was doing that. So you can use it in your life, okay? Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> okay. 